So uh, this this is the uh, this is an outline of the presentation. Can you see it? Uh, the first slide of the outline. Yes. Good. Uh, so what I, I'm going to explain from basics what are fractals and why they make reservoir modeling very easy. And also, before we get into the modeling, we need to agree on the definitions. Without agreement on definitions, we can't explain reservoir modeling. And I'm going to go over briefly the definitions, as you can see on the screen there, free water level, etc. In reservoir modeling, we, we, we need an SW versus height function. I'm going to explain why that is required and how we can derive that from the science of fractals. And I'm going to show you several case studies where we're applying these ideas to reservoir modeling. So fractals, fractals are everywhere. You've possibly seen this diagram. As you zoom in on this diagram, the image continues indefinitely. It's, it infinitely regresses. This is, this is what people understand as a fractal. But fractals are actually everywhere. We see fractals on every scale. We see them on a small scale. One example is, is snowflakes, as shown on the left. They're all individual, but as you zoom in, they continue and reproduce indefinitely. We see fractals throughout nature. I've given you an example here on the right of a Roman cauliflower. You can see how the thing is developing and repeating. We see fractals on our scale, the human scale. When you look out, you see a, a peacock. The feathers are fractal. They're repeating. The human brain itself is fractal. And I'll explain why that is the case. We see fractals on the continental scale, say North America or Africa. These are pictures taken from space. On the left, we've got canyons. And these canyons are repeating structures. When we zoom in, we see the same kind of pattern repeating. On the right, we've got shorelines, and I will go into this in more detail. We see fractals on the global scale. On the left, we've got the Himalaya. These mountains, when seen from space, have certain features, but if we zoom in on these large structures, we see the smaller ridges having the same kind of shapes, and the ridges on those are the same again. It's a repeating structure. On the right, I've got river channels. This is a photograph I took when I was flying into Basra in Iraq to give this presentation. You can see the channels are very similar as you get closer. And I'll explain why this is the case. Now we see fractals actually on the scale of the universe. What could it, couldn't be bigger? The universe, 15 billion, maybe 100 billion light years across. When we look at the universe, we see the cosmic microwave background as shown here. This photograph is, uh, is taken from a book by Professor Brian Cox, who noted the interesting fractal nature of the universe. Now, the cosmic microwave background is left over from the Big Bang. It's the quantum fluctuations in the beginning, sound waves, in fact, in the plasma. And this gives rise to these shapes here. But when we zoom in closer, we see the shapes continue. It looks the same, however close we get. Now, these patterns are very important, as these patterns give rise to galactic superclusters. And inside these superclusters, 
they're built up from galaxies themselves. So all the way down from the biggest picture, the universe is fractal. And most importantly for us reservoir engineers and petrophysicists, they are fractal, as I will demonstrate. So what are fractals? It's an ever never-ending pattern. Fractals are infinitely complex, but they look the same on every scale. They're created by a simple re repeating process. And the name was, was coined by B. B. Mangelbrock, and this is one of his uh, uh, diagrams shown here. This presentation will be giving out as a PDF afterwards, so you don't have to take copious notes. I've only got one question for you. You've got to figure out what the B stands for, the middle name for, for Mandelbrot. Now, other names for fractals are self-similarity, because they keep repeating themselves, and scale invariance, which is important for reservoir modeling. We see the same on every scale. But what is important, fractals can be represented by a simple algorithm. So the fractals are very useful. As I say, they are objects where the parts are similar to the all except for the scale. Let us take this example here as a tree. It's a, it's a cartoon of a tree, but it, it explains what I'm trying to tell you. When we look at the tree from a distance, we see this overall shape. But what you notice as you're walking closer, this major branch here, contains the same structure as a tree. And as you get towards the smaller branches and to the twigs, you see the same repeating structure all the way down from the twigs up to the old tree. Why is this? Well, this is an advantage for trees and for humans is that the information for the tree is, is contained in the seed. And that information is not a blueprint for the tree. It's a simple instruction. And the instruction says, grow a bit and branch, grow a bit and branch. And from that simple instruction, you can build a beautiful, huge tree like this. So it's a mathematically a simple way of describing complexity. So if you can discover the, the algorithm, you can describe very complex things, including hydrocarbon reservoirs. But how do we verify if something, if, if something is fractal? Let us take the example of a coastline. Let, and we want to know what the length of Great Britain's coastline is. So this is Great Britain. We want to know what the, the distance around the coast is. To do that, you need to have a ruler. You need to measure it. So we said the length of the ruler is R, and the total length of the co coastline is N. Now, the length of the coastline will depend on your ruler. When we have a very coarse ruler, as shown here in purple, we measure a coastline of nine. If we take a smaller ruler, then we can get into the estuaries and we measure a longer coastline. Similarly, in the orange and the yellow, as we use smaller decreasing uh, ruler sizes, we get longer coastlines. So how do we know, how does this tell us that it is fractal? So as I said, the ruler shrinks and the measured coastline increases. Now, what I want to do is to plot the ruler length against the coastline length. So it's log R and log N. This is on a log scale. So these are the different colors, and these are represented on this simple cross plot. Petrophysicists and reservoir engineers like cross plots. They tell us a lot of information. So when we plot, the ruler length against the coastline on log scales, 
if they fall on a straight line, as they do here, this shows us that the, the relationship is fractal. The coastline is fractal. It is the same however close you get. And, and the, the gradient of this line, D, is a fractal dimension. So that was the, UK, the Great Britain coastline. Now let us look, we're more interested in reservoir rocks. Now, if we've got thin sections of reservoir rocks imaged by a scanning electron microscope, we get something like this. And if we dye the, this, the cross section, we, we can actually emphasize the porosity. So the porosity here is shown in white, and the porosity is therefore the number of, of, of white pixels divided by the overall space, which is one. So it's very simple. You can get a computer to calculate the porosity of this thin section by just calculating the number of white spots. But the number of, of spots depends upon the pixel size. So as you zoom in, you'll see more and more porosity, like you saw more and more coastline when you're a smaller ruler. So at different magnifications, the number of pixels representing porosity is accounted and plotted as shown. So as with the coastline, we plot the pixel size, the size in the image, and against the, the porosity. And as you can see, this is an example of a Brea sandstone from the North Sea. The relationship in log-log space is a straight line. And this proves that these, these rocks are fractal in nature. And we'll return to this in a little while. So why do we need a reservoir model? The 3D reservoir model is required to calculate the hydrocarbon in place for reservoir modeling and for simulation. It's something like this. It looks like a, a Lego block where the different colors can represent frosties, zones, fasces, and so on. The idea is that you make a reservoir model, you populate it with water and hydrocarbon, you and then you sum up and calculate the total hydrocarbon in place. Also use the model to be able to predict where the best places, the sweet spots in the, in the field. For drilling. Now the reservoir model requires fluid contacts, a net reservoir cutoff, and a water saturation versus height function. The model is calibrated or is matched against a limited amount of information which is acquired from the well locations shown as these vertical lines in black. These wells will give, are limited in core and electrical data, and we have to use that to build a reservoir model. And we need this, we need these different parameters. One of the important things we need for the model is a, a water saturation versus height function. <clears throat> this is used to initialize the 3D model with hydrocarbon and water. It tells us how the water saturation varies as a function of height above the free water level. <clears throat> as an example here, we've got water saturation against height, and usually, but this is not always the case, as you go above the free water level, which I'm going to explain later, the water saturation generally decreases. So we need to have this function to be able to populate and to initialize our 3D model. <clears throat> this function tells how the, the formation porosity is split between hydrocarbon and water. That is the water saturation. <clears throat> it also tells us the shape of the transition zone. A good saturation height function 
requires three independent sources of fluid distribution data to be consistent. <clears throat> this is the formation pressure data from, from the um, RFT. Perhaps electrical log data, say for the resistivity log, and very importantly, the core data. The function must account for variant porosity and permeability and fluid contacts in, in the 3D model. It must upscale correctly, but very importantly for the reservoir here, it must be convincing and it should be easy to apply. So before we go into the, the function itself, we want to agree upon the definitions we're using in reservoir modeling. And these are the four definitions I want to just briefly run over. The first is the bulk volume of water. This is simply the uh, porosity times the water saturation. It's the blue area in a unit volume of rock. That is BVW. Whereas the water saturation is the percentage of water in the porosity alone. So BVW is the volume of water in a unit volume of reservoir. BVW is what we measure by the electrical logs and by core analysis. <clears throat> the electrical logs don't measure SW. They measure the conductivity of the bulk volume of water. Core analysis doesn't measure SW. It measures the BVW, the water expelled from the core at different pressures. So electrical logs and core do not measure SW directly. In fact, you can do the, all of petrophysics without SW. The second definition I want to remind us of is the free water level. <clears throat> this is an horizontal surface of zero capillary pressure. If you drill the hole in the ground where you stood now, Eventually, you would you'd meet the water in the, in the in the formation, and it would settle out, and that is the free water level. The free water level is where fluid would separate out in a very wide borehole, as shown here. The free water level is the intersection of the formation pressures, and I will go into this in more detail. Below and above the free water level. Notice that these are straight lines. It is also very important as it is the starting point for the SWI function as shown on the left. Now we contrast that with the hydrocarbon water contact. This is the height in the reservoir where the pore entry pressure is sufficient to allow hydrocarbon to start invading the formation pores. So at a certain height above the free water level, hydrocarbon will get into smaller and smaller pores. So this depends on the local porosity and permeability. So this surface is of variable height, whereas the free water level is a horizontal surface. So really the, the free water level is much more important than the, than the water contact. The third definition I want to discuss is irreducible water saturation. Reservoir engineers ask for SWIR. It's the lowest water saturation that can be achieved in a core plug. It's achieved by flowing hydrocarbon through a sample or spinning the sample in a centrifuge. It depends upon the drive pressure, therefore, or the centrifuge speed, how much water is displaced. So the water saturation, therefore, depends upon the height above the free water level. So a minimum SW irreducible does not exist. This curve will go on and get asymptotically closer and closer to this zero line here. So don't worry, there is no such thing, such thing as an irreducible water saturation, as a transition zone extends indefinitely. And this is what core analysts 
believe, and this is what we see from the logs. So let's have a look at some real data now. Cross plots. We're making a cross plot here of a multi-well field in the North Sea. We're plotting water saturation between zero and one against the height above the free water level, in this case, feet. The z-axis is colored by porosity. We see this typical shotgun pattern, which we need to understand. But when we color it by porosity, we notice that the, the uh, highest porosities, shown in red, are generally on the left and asymptotically fall down to the free water level. But as we go to lower porosities, shown in blue, the data moves to the right and up to the top right, such that at very low porosities, shown in green, we can, we can have water saturations that is hundreds of feet above the free water level. The rock is fully water saturated above the free water level. And we need to understand this to be able to initialize our 3D model. We need to define an SW height function for this complex data set. So this is what they, they used to do historically. They used to split the water saturation by porosity band. So the, the ice porosities with the left and the lower porosities with the top, top right. This is an actual example from a, a submission to the British government to develop a field. And what you can see right away there's something very suspicious going on. First of all, the curves here are unconvincing because they cross. So visually and mathematically, they are very poor. To be able to define each of these curves, you need sufficient data in each porosity band. So you need to drill wells in poor parts of the field so you can have this curve here. Also, to mathematically fit this curve, you need to define the pore entry pressure or the threshold height as shown here before you can fit the curve. So this is very difficult. So let's look at an easier way of doing this. Here's our data from this field in the North Sea. We've got water saturation against height. and we want to understand the relationship. The next slide shows you what happens when we change the water saturation axis to the bull volume of water, BVW. So what happens? All the data collapses to a single curve. All the porosities are now intermingled. This function is independent of porosity and permeability. So it, it makes reservoir engineering simple because you haven't got a, a multiple curves like this. You've just got a single one. You've got a simple BVW against height. And I'll return to this. But the, the important thing is the BVW is independent of the rock properties. It's independent of the zonation, the lithofascist type, uh, permeability, the grain size, and so on. Now, many reservoir engineers and geologists won't believe this, and it can be easily proved by using this powerful tool called a cross plot. You plot SW against height with the z-axis being the color. The z-axis, which represents the color, could be the, the, the uh, porosity, the permeability, or grain size. Then when you change the axis to BVW, they all collapse. This proves that it is independent of the z-axis. Now let, you let me tell you about water. We might be interested in, in hydrocarbon, but 
but the water is, is, is a powerful controlling factor in the reservoir model. As we know, H2O is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, as, as shown here. But you probably haven't realized that it's in this, this shape of a boomerang, and it is polarized to a distinctive oxygen end and a positive hydrogen end. This causes the water molecules to be strongly attached, attracted to each other and to the reservoir rocks. This is the profound importance of this structure. Now, in our reservoir, we're looking at the competing electrostatic forces against gravity. And these forces are very different. The electrostatic force is 10 to the power of 36 times greater than the gravitational force. So therefore, the water plays a great part in the model. In fact, the water was in the reservoir first. Before the hydrocarbons migrated into the trap, the buoyancy forces exerted by the lighter oil or gas pushed the water down in, that was previously in the pore space downwards. So you, first you add water, then you had migrations of hydrocarbon, and some of the water was pushed down to the free water level. Now, not all the water is displaced. Some of it is held by the capillary forces, these massive electrostatic forces within the rock. Narrow, narrow capillaries, pores with smaller pore throws, with larger, have larger surface area and will hold onto the water the strongest. And this has a, has a profound effect. You've probably seen this, a capillary tube the water rises at the capillary tube because of the French wetting of the water. The electrostatic force is pulling it up there. And it gives you this familiar meniscus or curved shape. You probably didn't realize that the shape of the curve on the outside is even greater because the surface area of the capillary tube is, is greater on the outside. Let me remind you about this. If we have three different capillaries, the ones with the smallest, the smallest capillary draws up the water the furthest. This is because the smaller pore throats have, have a larger surface area and hold on to the most water. Consequently, hydrocarbon requires more pressure to enter the small pores. The equations which explain this, which are in the in the uh, paper. So I won't go into them now, but it's uh, this is the, the, the capillary pressure equation based uh, upon the radius of the capillary. Now, the water, what happens? The force of gravity on the column of water is determined by the difference between the water and oil densities. And this is called the buoyancy of pressure. And it's given by this simple equation here. It is just based on the difference in densities between the two fluids. So the water at a given height in the reservoir is determined by the balance between the capillary forces holding up the immobile water to the force of gravity pulling the water downwards. The oil is the mobile phase and is the and only enters the leftover space in the reservoir pores that the water doesn't want. The water votes very highly because of its electrostatic force, and then the hydrocarbon can only go where in the leftover space. So consequently, in a given part of the pore space with the reservoir will contain both oil and water. And we know this to be the water saturation, SW. So this is what a simple SW height function would look like. But that is not always the case, as I will show you. Now, the capillary bound water comprises a continuous column of water in the oil lake, which is shown here. Throughout the water lake, and it continues throughout the oil lake. The oil is located in the remaining pore space and is also a continuous phase and pressure, 
but it has a lower pressure gradient. So in, in all the pore spaces, oil and water coexist. But the forces on the two are, are different. The intersection of these two curves, these lines, indicates the free water level. It's important to realize the formation press tester only sees the mobile phase. So the buoyancy pressure, the difference between these two lines, increases with the height above the free water level. As the buoyancy pressure increases with the height above the free water level, the oil will displace more and more water from the increasingly smaller pores. Therefore, water saturation will tend to decrease with height above the free water level. Now, fractals describe the, the pore network. There's more information about this in the paper, but it, it reduces to a very simple algorithm or equation. The porosity is a function of the radius of the rock capillaries. As I said, it is in, this, in the paper here, if you want to follow it. And from this first equation, by very simple manipulation of parameters, we can, we can derive this BVW function, the fractal function or foil function. BVW is equal to a function of height of the free water level with constants A and B. So this is the function here. BVW is the bottom of water, which is just a product of water saturation and porosity. It's the percentage of water in a unit volume of rock. H is the height above the free water level, and A and B are just constants. So this function is based on fractals, it's based upon the bulk volume of water. It's independent of fascist type, porosity and permeability, which can be easily verified using a cross plot. So two parameters completely describe your reservoir. So let's have a look at uh, the first case study. This is a, a data set used by the London Petrophysical Society. It's a very difficult data set as it's a very heterogeneous formation. As you can see, the porosity in this track here varies widely. The permeabilities go from uh, diocese down to microdiocese. And we've got a very complex CPI. And the water saturation increases with height, which is is not what we intuitively expect. One thing that does decrease with height is the bulk of the water is shown in white here. Now, the London Petrophysical Society wants to understand and derive an SWI function for this complex data set. So they asked for a shootout between several industry suppliers of functions, including the fractal function. So how did they determine which one was the best one? Well, they wanted to see which one gave the best match between SW derived from the resistivity log and the one from the function, as I'll show you on the next slide. So in this track here on the left, we've got the water saturation in black derived from the resistivity RT. The red curve is the water saturation derived from the, the fractal function. And as you can see, there is a good match in all different lithotypes. In the higher porosities, in the shalier zones, there's a very good match. Permeability varies massively, but it is not required in this equation here because it's just a simple function of height. And in fact, the old reservoir is defined by just two parameters, A and B. So if SW can be predicted with this accuracy, do we really need resistivity logs? Now, what I mean by that is, 
if you have a reservoir and from the best wells, you can derive this function here. If you drill another well and in that well, the resistivity log fails, can you justify to the company of rerunning with a loss of rig time, the resistivity log, if you can predict the water saturation with this accuracy from the function from the other wells. <laughs> That's what I mean. So one thing the reservoir model needs is the net reservoir cutoff. <clears throat> what do I mean by that? <clears throat> this is required for upscaling reservoir model parameters. Net reservoir is defined as the proportion of reservoir rock that is capable of storing hydrocarbon. Very simple. It's relatively easy to pick and is usually based on a porosity cutoff. Do not confuse that with net pay. Net pay may be a useful parameter, but it, it is defined as the proportion of reservoir rock that will produce commercial quantities of hydrocarbon and is often used to select perforation intervals and is very difficult to pick. In fact, it depends on how carefully you develop the reservoir, how many wells you drill, what the drawdown is. So really, net pay depends on the oil price. So we need to know what res net reservoir is for, for our reservoir model. Now, what does the BVW function tell us about net reservoir? It tells us something profound. It tells us something very simple, as shown in this schematic. The BVW is a function of the height above the free water level and nothing else, such that at a certain level in the reservoir, say here, on the left, we've got rock, which is 20 porosity units, and on the right, 10 porosity units. And what the function is saying is that the water was there first, and it tells us how much water exists at that point level in the reservoir. The hydrocarbon comes later and goes in the remaining space. So at 20 porosity units, this BVW is the same as 10 porosity units. But as the, pro as the porosity is dropped from 20 to 10, the amount of space available for the hydrocarbon is decreased as shown. <clears throat> so, so basically, this is giving us the net reservoir cutoff. In this particular example, it's nine porosity units. So a net reservoir is defined as a rock capable of holding hydrocarbon. It's very important in the reservoir model because it's needed for averaging porosity permeability and water saturation. But the net reservoir cutoff varies as a function of the height above the free water level. It's not a constant throughout the reservoir. <clears throat> As I'll show you on the next slide. Here we've got a net pay flag shown in blue on the right hand side. And this is what we're going to be using to average the parameters in these intervals. So the net reservoir cutoff varies as a function of the height. So the reservoir high above the free water level as low water saturations, uh, sorry, low saturations of, of completely bound water, and the hydrocarbon enters the smaller pores. This is a net reservoir. So you've got high porosity here, but lower down, you've got porosity, which is even higher, but there is no hydrocarbon in the reservoir, and this is non-net. So the, so the reservoir high above the free water level has low saturations of completely bound water, and this is net, just above the free water level with high porosities, we've got high saturations of capillary bound water and there is no room for hydrocarbons. This is non-net. Now it's BBW function. It's a very simple function. It's a power function. A, H the power B. A and B are constants. The BVW function is a straight line when plotted on log scales. So if you plot BVW against height, this is from the core analysis, you get this linear equation. 
So as shown here, each of these is from six different fields. And in each field, we've got a straight line in log log space showing the variation of BBW with capillary pressure. How many points do you need to derive a straight line? Two points. Two points are required. So a lot of these other core measurements were not needed in all these six fields. Notice even more profoundly is that these fields share the same gradient. The gradient is, is scale invariant, which means that we can change capillary pressure to height. We can change height from feet to meters and back, and we will calculate the same gradient. The gradient B is if a, now the gradient seems to be the same. The gradient seems to be point, point 0.42. The answer is 42. So really, we only have a single parameter which is controlling the distribution of fluids in our reservoir. And I'll show you more cases that later. Now you're probably asking, can we believe this BBW function? How can we do a beauty contest to prove that it really works? Well, I'm going to show an example here where we convince the client in the Middle East that the, that the BVW, BVW function correctly predicted SW by comparing SW from the resistivity log, RT, from the BVW function and from core, as shown on this plot here. It's a thinly bedded reservoir. The resistivity log predicted water saturation is shown in black. The water saturation from the BVW function is shown in red, and from the core analysis, it's shown in blue. Now, these core water saturations are very high quality. They're Dean and Stark. The wells were drilled with oil-based mud, doped to identify any contamination. And they were cored only above the free water level, where the capillary bound water is immobile, and only the centers of the core plugs was was sampled. Now, what the result of this was that the BVW function matched the core. Now, the resistivity log was suppressed. Why was suppressed? Because the resistivity log can be adversely affected by conductive shales up to 30, 30 feet away. So the resistivity log is incorrect. The BVW function is correct as proved by matching the uh, core water saturations. Now the BVW function can give us not only one model for your reservoir, but it can give us two models, as shown here. The center track is the resistivity log usual CPI of the reservoir, showing the shales in green, the sandstones, the hydrocarbon in red, and the water in blue. This is the conventional interpretation and is shown by the black curve on the SW track. Contrast that with the BVW function on the right, where we have got a different computation of, of hydrocarbon and a different water saturations. So the resistivity log was logged yesterday and represents the current oil in place. The BVW function relates to the initial charging of the reservoir, so represents the initial oil in place. So by putting them next to each other here, we've got valuable information. By comparing the water saturation from the resistivity log, as I said, log yesterday, compared to the BVW function, which is historical, we've got information. In this upper zone, we have a difference which shows us the residual oil saturations. Contrast that with a deeper section here where we've got bypassed hydrocarbon. And this is where we, the client wanted to, to direct future wells. So the resistive log is incorrect in thin beds, as shown here, close to bed boundaries where the conductive shales exist. BVW function ignores thin beds 
bed boundaries in shales. So we can use this information to pick the free water level. These are four wells that don't intercept the free water level. But as we're using BBW, it's very simple. There's a trend. It's log log in. It's a straight line in log log space. And this trend tells us where the free water level is. We can also use this function to identify the hydrocarbon to water contact, which varies throughout the field depending upon the local poroperm. So the formation could be fully saturated for hundreds of feet above the free water level. And to get these curves, we just say that BVW is a product of water saturation and porosity. So we calculate water saturation and back out these curves. More information in the paper. So our single function splits into multiple SWI functions. And the BVW function gives a hydrocarbon contact as a function of porosity. You can see here that in a low porosity formation, five porosity units, the formation is fully water saturated for hundreds of feet above the free water level. We can also use this information for depth control. Depth is the most important measurement. True vertical depth could be out by plus or minus 30 feet due to sur survey errors and depth measurement errors. But you can use the, the free water level to normalize the wells. This is because the free water level is a plane, an horizontal plane. So if you're confident the wells are in the same compartment, you can use this information to normalize the depths. In a recent case study, recalibration of well depths based on the free water level changed a field's equity between two oil companies by 3%, which is a vast amount of money. Now, in the last case study I want to show you is the team I've been looking at fractal information throughout the uh, North Sea. And they looked at many, many different fields. And these fields were gas fields, gas condensates, and oil fields. They were of different depositional environments and of different ages. And the porosities varied considerably, as shown on this poor perm plot. Now, what did we learn from, from, from this study? Well, we compared these so-called transition zones. This is this is how the BVW varies as a function of height. Now, if in an ideal reservoir, you want you would want a good porosity because the porosity determines the, the amount of ivory calm that we can store. It. You'd also want in an ideal reservoir a good permeability because Permeability is a conduit of flow of the outer carbon to the wellbore. Also, you'd want an SWI function on the left here in the ideal field because it gives you the lowest water saturations for the same porosity. Now, the shape of this transition zone is related to the pore geometry rather than porosity or permeability alone. That's what the team found. And the BVW function quantifies the pore geometry in the constant A. So let us compare in all these fields, log and core derived fractal functions. We're plotting these BVW against height in log log space. On the left, we've got BVW, the bulk of water, against the height of the free water level from logs. So these represent the complete interval from the free water level to the top of the reservoir. In contrast, on the right, we've got the analysis from core. We measure capillary pressure at different BVWs. So, so there are many curves here because they're, they represent different core plugs. And the different colors correspond to the, the uh, colors on here. Now, what you notice is the log and core functions are the same, irrespective of whether they are determined from logs on the left or from core on the right. 
Therefore, you can use this, this plot to confirm the log and core quality because this code should be the same. If you get a different function from the core plugs, which are small plugs of, say, of an inch, compared to the reservoir, which we could hundreds of feet, it makes you be suspicious about your, your log-derived values or your core-derived BVW. So it's an indication of quality control. So in conclusion, we have derived a BVW function from the fractal nature of the reservoir. It can be derived from electrical logs or core data by using a simple linear regression in log-log space. The log and core give the same functions. Consequently, they QC each other. This confirms the fractal distribution of core plugs. The core plug will give you the same function as a complete reservoir. How can that be the case? How can that core plug represent the whole reservoir? It is because it's fractal. This function can give you the net reservoir cutoff. I showed you a case of nine porosity units. And it gives us the shape of a transition zone, which goes all the way from the free water level up to the top of the reservoir. There is no SW irreducible. It, it determines the free water level and gives us the hydrocarbon water contacts. It is very powerful for the reservoir engineer because it's independent of zonation, fascist type, porosity and permeability. So you can forget about thin beds, bed boundary effects and shaliness. And therefore it's very simple to implement in your reservoir model. So this is a key conclusion. When we plot water saturation against height in logs or in core, we get this scatter plot. But if we change the x-axis to both of the water, the data collapses to a single curve, so we can forget water saturation and think bulk volume of water. So, so after this presentation, I'm happy to answer questions tonight or later by email. Also for a, a number of participants, I am happy to look at your own data sets for your, for your fields. You can disguise the, the wells or I can, I can sign a non-disclosure agreement, but I'm keen to acquire more data on SWI functions. So I'm willing to look at your data privately after the presentation. Now, did anybody solve the, the only question I have here? What was B was B Mandelbrot's middle name? Did anybody get that? Well, that's the answer. His middle name was B -R B Mandelbrot and so on because his, his actual name was Fractal. So I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. I'll um, see if we've got anything in the chat. So you can type in any any questions you might you might have, or um, Paul can allow you to uh, unmute and uh, sp speak your um, questions. Hi, Steve. So there isn't any restriction. So um, persons can feel free to turn their mics on at any time if they have questions. Hi, Steve. I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you very much for your talk. It was really nice. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you can, you can do the all of petrophysics without water saturation. Water saturation was an unfortunate term which was invented. Everything in in, uh, in petrophysics from the from the logs, the logs actually measure the bulk of the water, the conductivity of the water. They don't measure water saturation. Similarly, the in the core analysis, it is always the core analysis of the amount of water expelled at different pressures. If the client wants water saturation, you've got to go to the extra task of dividing your BVW by porosity. You never measure water saturation directly. And if you think BVW, you've got a, a, a much simpler model.
Hi, Steve. I have a question. So yes. the um, based on what you were just saying, uh, using the SW derived from the BVW divided by porosity, the the BVW function, which is a h to the power of b, um, and using those two constants, which you can determine from your plot of height versus um, BVW, where you can generate the equation of a straight line. And for example, um, B is the slope of, of the line. How do you actually determine the, the BVW value to put onto your, onto your x-axis if, if BVW is equal to SW by porosity, but you're not using the SW from your resistivity curve, how do you get the BVW value? You can get uh, BVW directly. Uh, I did have a plot, did I have somewhere? Well, it's a it's a good question. Well, basically, you 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 would calculate your your water saturation and then multiply by process to get BVW. But uh, if you're a purist, you can actually work completely through the petrophysics just using BVW itself. Let's have a see what we got here. So. This is this is the relationship because it is it turns out to be a, an exponential function and it's an exponential function because it's derived from fractals. You get a straight line, and as I say, you only need two points to to derive a straight line. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these other core points are superfluous. Now the uh, the b value is the same. The gradient is the same. So really, there there is there is only one parameter, and that is a. Now that a represents the average pore geometry in the field. So that if you've got two fields, one in brown and one in blue, you will get a different BBW function because the average pore geometry is different. That is why you get a different curve in, in different fields. Now, if these fields hypothetically could be joined together over extended geological time, these two curves would, would come together. So people often ask, they say, well, if your function is independent or lithofascist type, why do you get a different function in different fields? Because each function represents the average Poor geometry in that field. As Leverett J's function also claims, that all of the fields acts as a single capillary. So when you go look at an outcrop, you just a few feet from each other or a few inches from each other, you see a vast change in poor perm characteristics. And you ask, how can, how can I model a reservoir which, which is hundreds of, of cubic meters? when it, it varies so much on the centimeter level. And the reason is because the, all the fields is acting as a single capillary, which is determined by the average pore geometry. <laughs> and and it, is, it is like that because the reservoir is fractal. So this, the core plug here sees the same function as the all of the fields. And that's why it's so powerful. That is why we say fractals are so powerful and they make reservoir engineering modeling easy because you've got a, a, a simple function. You do not need to worry about mapping permeability throughout your 3D model. Are there any more questions? I can ask another. So in terms of applying this to your volumetric equation, would you use like an average BVW value the same as you would an average SW value? 
all the BBW's values will uh, fall on a, a straight line. So it doesn't matter which one you use. So that is a good question because if you can calculate the, the BVW function, the fractal function in the thick beds in your reservoir, the thick beds where the resist, you bleed the resistivity log because it's well distant from the conductive boundaries, you calculate your function based on a couple of thick beds. You can apply that in all the wells in the field. You can apply it in the wells where you fail to get a resistivity log. You can, you can apply it in the wells where you've got a thin beds because it works there and you can, you can, you can uh, use it everywhere. So uh, a, a single BVW point is enough to understand your reservoir. So, so essentially a volumetric equation that includes BVW since it's SW by porosity, it's essentially BVW by your reservoir volume, which is area by thickness. Mm. And uh, a net to gross value mm. um, divided by a formation mm. volume factor or? Yes, you, you still need porosity. Uh, not not for the function, but you, you need porosity in your reservoir model to be able to um, calculate the the hydrocarbon in place. And because what I'm not showing today that the BVW function um, averages much better than the water saturation, such that if you populate your reservoir model, all the cells with porosity, then you apply your BVW function. You forget about water saturation. You cal you calculate the BVW in each of the cells. Then the difference in each cell of the porosity from the BVW is the, is the amount of hydrocarbon in that cell. So you've got porosity in the cell. You've got BVW. You take the difference between the two, and that is your hydrocarbon, volume of hydrocarbon, not saturation, right? the volume of hydrocarbon, you add up that volume of hydrocarbon in all your cells, and it gives you your total hydrocarbon in place without going through SW anywhere. Okay. I see. Thanks for your answer. I don't, I don't have any um, further questions. Um, I don't know if anyone else would like to ask anything. So somebody's asking about the... Um, gas oil contact and, and the oil water contact. Uh, in fact, you get a different function, different fractal function in the oil leg from the uh, gas leg. And I have got an article on LinkedIn which addresses that. So there's a slight complication. If your field has got a, a, a gas cap, oil field with gas cap, then you need two functions. The oil water, the, the oil oil function is based on the free water level and the the gas function is actually based on the on the gas to water uh, level which is which is shallower and uh, i've got a, a, an article on that on linkedin if uh, stephen wants to uh, send me a, an email and i'll and i will uh, point that out i think uh, um, I... yeah yeah sorry i that's okay. Uh, hi, good night, Steve. Uh, uh, this is Stephen speaking. I asked the question about the GOW versus the OWC. I also had a second question about, uh, based on that capillary pressure slide, do you see a difference in the function when it comes to thin bed pay? Well, the 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 the, the foil function would, would is is on the same scale. It, it works on the scale of a plug or the old reservoir, so it's the same function. So if you've got some thin beds, the resistivity log is incapable of giving you the, the true resistivity there or the conductivity. But uh, the the, the uh, fractal function will give you the the correct hydrocarbon. Does does that answer your question, Stephen? Yeah, it does. Uh, that that's where I was going because you said something very interesting. Why do we need the resistivity log if we have this great relationship, which probably angers a yeah. few wireline engineers? 
<laughs> yes, I used to work for Slumberger. They'd shoot me if I said that. But, but uh, <clears throat> my point is, is that you build the function from your early wells in the field where you've got good data. And you, and you derive the function, and then you can apply that later. So it's that if the resistivity log fails, you can still predict the, the water saturation based on the on the function because you know it is this, it applies to all the wells, irrespective of the local porosity, permeability, and fascist type. This is why I was I was uh, saying that to, you, you, do you really need the resistivity log if you can predict it uh, that that well? Yeah. I'll I'll tell you where that comes in really handy. We had a case where we could not control the well for logging. So we had to we had to run casing before getting logs. And all we could have done was a case of neutron. And we had to use an offset resistivity to predict perforated zones. So in, in a case like that, this would have come in really handy if we had that early data. Certainly, if you can uh, derive frosty from uh, some case or logs, then you've got all the information you need because you could use predict water saturation using this function. Yeah. Okay, so my last question isn't really a technical one, but I just was curious what it felt like when you plotted BVW and saw that it lined to that curve and it was independent of porosity. Did you have a eureka moment? <laughs> Uh, th this uh, this um, originally uh, function originated by empirical observation. It wasn't derived from fractals right at the beginning, and it, we were doing equity studies. Are you familiar with equities, where you you're trying to determine uh, be between two oil companies w w uh, the percentage of oil in one their side of the field compared to the other side of the field, and we had to follow uh, a book on how to derive porosity and, and so on every step. And uh, it was it was prescribed. And uh, when it came to the SWI function, they, they, they probably ran out of energy because it, it, the, the text says, uh, derive a simple and convincing SWI function. And and we, we worked, when I was with BP, we worked for ages trying to derive an SDI function because the data set was heterogeneous and very complex until we had that a eureka moment where we plotted BVW against that and it everything simplified. And so it was an empirical observation, which then took years to explain. And we explained it through core analysis and uh, other measurements. And when we when we looked at fractals, we could actually derive the function from, from the basic fractal uh, algorithm itself. Wow, re really interesting stuff. So thank you so much for this talk. Uh, we really appreciate it. Mm. Steve, um, there are some questions in the chat. I'm not sure yes. if you're seeing them. I can see the one from uh, Nadil. Uh, uh, if you have a field with different compartments, do you need a separate function for each compartment? Right. Now, if the compartments are isolated, then you need a different function. So if you do your fluid analysis, if your if your um, produced fluids are similar, and if you do you run your pressure testers and you see the gradients are the same. You probably infer the, and and the, and the geophysicist confirms that there are no faults. You can probably say that they're the same compartment, and therefore, the data will show you that you've got the same function. If you've if if you if you've got a if there's if the compartments are not connected, like the different fields as shown in this slide here, you will get a different function because it represents the average pore geometry in that compartment. But most most fields, the, the faults are not sealing. And uh, over geological time, we've got the same fluids, same water salinities, same hydrocarbons. And we have a, it, the old field is represented by a single capillary and we get a simple function, which is represented by the core here. And I said, you need two core plugs 
to to derive this line. In fact, as we know what B is now, is it's um is four two, we in fact only want need one core plug to define the function for that field. Clearly, you have to have more to get confidence, but that is the case. Each of these core plugs here costs um hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, and yet they're all saying exactly the same thing. <laughs> I hope that answers Khalil's question. Um, Steve, there are also two others. I'm not sure if you're seeing it, so I can read it mm -hmm. to you. Uh, the first is by Herman. In general, do you have any comments regarding very low water salinities? Very low water salinities are a challenge for petrophysics. Because you you can't measure the uh, the conductivity of the water uh, very easily. There's a large error bar, so therefore you'd probably want to use other measurements. Um, nuclear magnetic resonance can give you a, a salinity independent SW. It becomes more important that you have the uh, do quality core water saturations, and I give you an example of what quality core saturations are. Dean and Stark, drilling with oil-based mud, uh, sampling from the center of the cores, doping the mud to see any contamination. Um, low salinity uh, uh, waters um, are a challenge, yes. But the, 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 the function uh, works the same. If you can divide, if you can div derive the function in your best zones, in the best wells, just from a few points, then that function will be valid everywhere throughout your fields. There's another question. Is there any significance to the slope break in the capillary pressure versus BBW slide for the Jurassic marine formation? Mm -hmm. This is the, the, the one here. <clears throat> Well, as I said, the one of the advantages of, of this function is that you can compare your logs derived function with your core derived function. Even though on different scales, the function will be the same. And if they're not the same, this would indicate not a problem, but indicate plugs that you should go back and re-examine or logs interpretations to re-examine. So I would say that this kink in this curve here, su suggesting that maybe the, the, the measurement would have changed, or you, you, that there was there was some problem with the core plugs here, which by the eye seems to suggest that there is a kink, which is not really there. So this this plot should be used for quality control to to put, pinpoint which core plugs should be looked at more carefully. These plugs may be fractured, may be chipped and not give the right measurement. So this is very useful for quality control. And uh, Paul has asked a similar question. <clears throat> Can we derive a, a BVW function from, from core analysis without water saturation calculation? Definitely. When you send your core plugs off to a core laboratory, what you get back does not include water saturation. All their tests are done on BVW, the amount of water expelled from the plug under different pressures. This corresponds to height. SW is not included. <laughs> SW is only added for convenience of the oil oil company because historically they've used water saturations. You can go completely throughout the calculations and calculate your function from the from the core analysis just from BVW. In fact, if you use BVW and not SW, you'll probably get a more accurate function. And I'm happy to uh, look at your data sets after this presentation. Um, we can discuss that. Uh, 
I can help you derive a fractal function. Because it's so easy and simple, it won't take long. You can disguise the information, the wells, if you want, or I can write, I can sign a non-disclosed agreement. Um, I, I work with individuals doing uh, doing their PhD research or uh, masters are doing their projects. I have done, I did a major project recently uh, for Shell uh, in the UK on one of their fields, and they use uh, total porosity throughout. One of the questions is, does it work with total porosity or effective porosity? It works with both. In their case, they wanted to uh, use total porosity. I, I, I did work for, for BP for a time, and they use effective porosity, and the, the fractal function works with that as well. The only proviso is when you use effective porosity, you must use effective water saturation and total porosity because with total water saturations. So I look forward to, you can send me a cross plot of, of your data from core or lots for, for my comments. And please uh, search out the paper uh, and also on LinkedIn, if you go into my articles, I've got many articles which would address certain questions about the BVW function. Thank you so much, Steve. Well, I don't think we have any further questions. Oh, what we can do is probably provide the, the presentation uh, along with your paper when it is we send out the emails, but also with the link to the recording so persons can have access and perhaps a note on you being able to help anyone that needs assistance and and also um, share your email address on that email also because we have everyone's contact. Yes, uh, they're willing to see the, the PDF of this uh, presentation as well, yes. And uh, obviously you've got the recording and yeah. Yeah. So I think that brings us to the end. Steve, thanks so much for taking the time to share your expertise from your years of work in this area. We really appreciate it, especially because it's it's also very late in the UK. And so okay. thanks again so much and thanks for everyone for attending. We it's nearly, nearly midnight here and uh, yeah. we're much uh, sharper in the evening in the morning, so I don't mind. So um, everybody, enjoy petrophysics. Enjoy reservoir modeling. It's um, it's easier than you think, it, and it can be fun. Thanks so much, Stephen. Have a good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.